left. I left. Uh, I left before um, service was even over, um, just after I introduced Mark, um, because I, honestly, I just didn't even feel like being here. Uh, it was a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty rough week. This whole week has been for me. Last Friday, uh, leading up to the weekend, my, uh, my brother gives me a call and, uh, to let me know that my uncle died. And that's pretty heavy because uh, you may think, oh, big deal, it, it's an uncle. But, uh, you know, w with everything I've been through, it, it would seem like it, it's not that big a deal because, you know, my, my parents died, my stepmom even died, and, you know, aunts, uncles, all four sets of grandparents are all dead. You know, all, all by the time I was college, everyone's pretty much dead. And, uh, and so you think, okay, well, what's another uncle, you know? And yet, um, I guess it just, it absolutely killed me because, because he didn't believe, uh, didn't believe in Jesus at all by any stretch of the imagination, and um, and so when he called me and he said that on the phone, honestly, I can say that was one of the saddest days of my life, and and I remember just coming to church on you know because I flew right out there last Friday and uh, um, just be with my aunt and kind of process through with her and flew back on Saturday for church and and just wasn't in the mood for for anything. Um, and all week, just kind of feeling that way. And, and I saw myself at church, like, kind of shaking people's hands like usual, saying, hey, how are you doing, with a smile on my face, when the last thing I felt like doing was smiling. The um, last thing I felt like doing was talking about my baby and, you know, as you ask questions and this and that. And I, I, just, I just left there going, you know, I'm, I'm being so fake right now. And this is everything I used to hate about church growing up. You know, you get to church, and the pastor's like, oh, praise the Lord. And you're like, shut up. You, you don't... <laughs> You don't mean that, you know? It was, it was the insincerity, and I'm like, wow, that is totally me this, that, that weekend. It was just a total fake, oh, no, things are good, oh, yeah, baby's fat, you know, whatever. And, <laughs> and I was like, I didn't really care. I, I, I wasn't into it, and, and just, uh, you know, so I just said, you know what, I, rather than be fake, I just want to leave, because uh, it's just something I never wanted to be. Um, and, and honestly, you know, th this week, it, it's been a pretty miserable week, because... Uh, you know, when someone dies and doesn't know the Lord and you actually stop and think about it, it's probably the most miserable thing you could do on this planet. It's probably the most painful thing you can do on this planet. Um, and it's been a miserable week for me. Don't feel like laughing. Don't feel like smiling. It's just sad. Um, I, I, I think of passages in Scripture, you know, like Lazarus and the rich man that we looked at not too long ago, and you think, wow, that's my uncle right now. The same with someone, just please, just dip their finger in a little bit of water and stick it on my tongue. Just, just do anything. Just, just go back. Would you just at least warn them? What would you do? You know, and, and, uh, and you don't have another chance. The finality of it's what killed me. You know, just walking up and seeing the body and just going, that, that's it. That's it. There's, there's, not a, there's not a chance. There's nothing I can say. And, and, you know, you start thinking, man, I, I really would. I really, I thought this through. I'd give everything I owned right now if I could just have an hour with him and just to talk to him. And just to, just to man, if I, I could go back just for an hour. And, and the thing is, is I, I haven't spoken to my uncle in about eight years. Um, not, not by my own desire, but because he forbade me. Um, didn't want me over his house. Didn't want me talking to him. Nothing. Didn't want anything to do with me disagreed with some things in my life early on, and, um, and I even thought, I even thought three weeks ago, I thought, you know what, it doesn't matter, it's been eight years, I need to just go to his house, I was in the Bay Area speaking at something, and I thought, you know, I could just swing by the house, and just let him read me, let me just, just let him read me for, for everything, everything I've ever done wrong, what, whatever, just, just let him go for it, and just, just suck it up, and take it, you know, and, uh, you know, because, because there's no point in getting angry at him, you know, because there's a side that was like, man, how could you do this? You know, I don't have that many relatives. And, and my kids, they, they, you don't even let them see you. you you're not even build a relationship. And, but, but, you know, as, as Chuck Colson said once, he says, you know, getting mad at an unbeliever is like getting mad at a blind man who stepped on your foot. You know, it's just, it's just stupid. You just don't do that. And... And, and just realizing, gosh, you know, why, why ever blame people for things? Because as I look back, if I, if I were the man that I, I should have been, and if I had the humility that I ought to have, 
then things would be different. And these relationships that are broken, that we always think are the other person's fault, you know, we don't look deeply enough at ourselves and go, you know what, if I was the guy I was supposed to be, that relationship would be okay. I could make up for the other stuff. And, and, and I don't know, it's just... I, I was reading this week, I was reading, uh, I was reading the book of Ecclesiastes. I just read it through a couple of times. And I felt like for the first time in my life, I get it. I finally got it. I mean, I, you know, you, I studied in school, you know, did, did my work in school and seminary, and you read through and you understand what it means, but you don't get it. You know, a lot of passages you don't really get until you get to a certain point in your life and you read and go, ah, oh, now I'm tracking. Because you can understand the historical context and you can understand, you know, the cultural, you know, setting in which everything was put. And you're le- you learn to do that and that's important. You can figure out grammatically how everything fits and how the sentences are structured. But, but one of the things that, that you, we never talk about is the emotional context with which this book is written. Because this wasn't written by a, a computer. It was written by people. And when you stop and you think through, what was that person going through when he wrote that and when he said that? I mean, there's something powerful about that. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it's it's this guy who lives life, okay? And and he was the wisest man who ever lived. Okay, it's written by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. He was the richest man. He was the most powerful man because he was the king. He had endured, he had, he, he had more pleasure, more fun than anyone in this room will ever have. He just let it go, you know, whether it was, you know, getting wasted, being with, you know, over a thousand women. I mean, just, it was just, you know, as much fun as I can have in a lifetime. Let me go for it. As many possessions as I can acquire, and he did it. As much power as I can have, and as much wisdom. And at the end of it, you know, he writes this book, Ecclesiastes, and talks about life and, and teaches us now. Now that he's wise, now that he's lived it all and he's done it all, he writes this book, and the first thing he says, the first words out of this guy's mouth, you read it in chapter one, he says, meaningless. That's the first word out of his mouth. And then his second word is even better. He says, meaningless. And then the next sentence is utterly meaningless. And then the next sentence is everything is meaningless. And you go, that's the wisest man on the earth? But it's like this week, I got it. I totally get it. Because when you read through the book, he starts talking about death all through the whole thing. And his point is, is at the end of life, he's looking at everything he ever pursued, everything he ever did. He goes, man, that was so empty. Is everything, everything on this earth is so empty and so stupid. It's pointless. It's empty. It's vain. It's meaningless. And, and, and I get it now because the point is, is when someone dies, you realize what really matters. And you start looking at everything and you go, why does that matter? Why does that matter? Why does that matter? Why does that matter? And you start reading this book and Solomon goes, okay, I'm the wisest man on the earth. So what? I'm going to die. You're stupid. I'm smart. We both die. So what? Is my death better because I was smart when I died? He goes, I'm rich. You're poor. We both die. Then then where does my stuff go? Where does your stuff go? It doesn't matter. We're both dead. He goes, so I had a lot of fun. You didn't. We're both dead. So what? And, and he, he starts looking at everything in light of death and, and, and the whole finality of it all, going, what, what in life really matters? How much of what we do is just absolutely meaningless? And so when someone passes away, it gets you in this mindset of, okay, what matters now? Does it matter that I kept my pride and I didn't stand there and let him yell at me? Does that matter? No, it doesn't. You start realizing all the things you do in life that are absolutely meaningless, 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 everything meaningless, pointless. Why did I do that? Why did I spend my money on that? I could have given it that. I could have done this. I could have done that. I could have used my time for that. And now I look back and go, wow, what a waste. These are the words that he has for us. And he talks about death. 
And in and, 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 and chapter 7, he, he gives us these words, he gives us these phrases, which at first, you, you, you look at it and they sound paradoxical. They sound like, okay, he's, he's, telling a, he's making a bunch of false statements. But he's not. These are true statements. They just appear false to us because we never hear them. No one talks like him. No one says these things. We don't hear these types of phrases. And, and the first time you hear it, you go, what? No, no, no. But then the deeper you, you look into it, the thinker thinks it through and goes, wow, he really gets it. There is a lot of meaningless stuff. He says in chapter 7, he says, he says a good name is better than fine perfume. And the day of death is better than the day of, death, of, of birth. He says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man, and the living should take this to heart. He says, sorrow is better than laughter. You hear that all the time, huh? Because a sad face is good for the heart. He says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the, how, the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. So it's better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. So, so, so he starts off, and okay, the first thing he says is, okay, a good name is better than fine perfume. Okay, and I understand that being named Francis, okay? But, but that's, that's not really what he's talking about. Okay, what he's talking about is a good name in the sense of, you know, who you are. That's what a name was, okay? That's not what we think of today. But, you know, when he talks about someone's name, it's his character, his very being. And he says, you know what, what's, what's more important is who you are. More important than what you have. Even if you have all this stuff, if you don't amount to anything, you at the core of who you are... It's pointless. And yet most of the people today were willing to compromise for money. We're willing to stretch the truth a little bit so that we can save a little money. You know, why? Because we're, we're concerned about this stuff and not losing this stuff and getting more stuff rather than, I mean, how much time do you spend in, 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 a, in a day thinking about your name, your character, and who you are as a person? And yet how much time do you spend in a given day thinking about what you can acquire and stuff? And yet what Solomon is saying that, well, no, no, it's, it's, your, it's who you are at the end of your life. Your character, that's more important. I mean, understand his emotion is, here's a guy at the end of his life going, it's like a, a parent, you know, saying, gosh, I've gone down that road, you don't want to do it. And that's what Solomon, that's why he's, he's using the strongest words he can say. He goes, it's meaningless. He, and he uses the phrase, he goes, it's like chasing after the wind. He goes, if you can do that, why don't you go run after the wind, see if you can catch it, Go. He goes, this is so dumb. Trust me, I've been there. Everything is meaningless. And if you're going to try to acquire a bunch of stuff, that's pointless. What's more important is your name and who you are. And then he says that the day of death is better than the day you were born. When's the last time you heard that? We just, we just, had, a, we just had a baby. And it's like, oh, no way. What a great day. In fact, before the baby's born, let's have a shower. Let's have a few showers for you. You know, let's just throw a bunch of gifts at you because we can't wait till this baby's born. And then once the baby's born, let's give you more presents because the baby's born. How big was she? You know, you know, how fat was she? How long was she? You know, everything's about the birth. And what a great day. What a wonderful day. What day was she born? Let's celebrate that day every day, every year. Every year of her life, let's celebrate the day she was born. And then what we do when someone dies? Just keep this short. Let's just do the funeral. Let's just move on. We need to move on in life. And yet Solomon says, no, the day of death is better. That's, that's an exciting time for the person who has a good name. I understand if a person just has a bunch of possessions and just dies with a bunch of stuff, yeah, that's miserable. But a person who dies, maybe having given it all away during his lifetime, and, 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 and has a good name, actually lived for something, believed in something, he says the day of that person's death is way better than the day he was born. I mean, if we as believers can't celebrate our deaths, what can we celebrate? 
You know, I, I mean, think, I think about the, the day that I die. You know, for a lot of people, you, you, they're going to think it's a sad day. And, and I just think, man, that should be the day you celebrate, not my birthday. Throw a shower when I die. You know, I mean, serious. Buy each other gifts and go, man, he always wanted to be up there. And there he is. You know, I mean, what a, what a, what a celebration. And, and Solomon says, you know, the, the day of death is better than the day of birth. But he says a really interesting thing, and this is the, the, the verse I can't get over. It's verse 2 when he says, It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. It's better. It's better to go to a house of mourning. A house of mourning was when someone died within that household, what would happen is they would have like a week. They would have seven days of the severe lamenting. And then after the seven days, they would have another 23 days of grieving. It's not as intense as the first seven days, but it's still equally, you know, sad. And, and, and so you've got this 30 days, you know, taking place in this house where they're just bawling their eyes out the first week. And then afterwards, just dealing with it, grappling with it. And Solomon says, you know, that's a good house to visit. He says, it's better for you to stay in there and to think about that for a while than it is for you to just go on to the next party. And, and uh, you know, we just don't think this way at all. I mean, how often do you think that it would be a good idea to just go spend some time with people that are just bawling their eyes out and mourning? And he says, that's better. He doesn't say it's more fun. Okay, the word there is the word good. It's more good. It's better. You see, a lot of times we think, well, if it's not fun, how can it be good? Because we think those two are synonymous. We go to wherever it's most fun because we think, well, that's a good place because it's fun. And Solomon says, no, what's, what's the greater good is if you would spend time in a place of mourning rather than a place of feasting. And he explains why. He says, because death is the destiny of every man and the living should take this to heart. He says, you know why it'd be good for you to go to a house of mourning where everyone's weeping and they're thinking about this death? He says, because you need to think about death. He says, because that's your destiny. It was so good for me to walk up to a casket and see a dead body in there. Not saying it was fun, not saying it was enjoyable, but it was good. It was good for me. Because you look at a, a, a pile of bones and flesh and go, man, that, that's my destiny. You just go, that's, that's how it ends. And he says, you, you know why it's good for you to go to that? He says, because that's your destiny, and the living should take this to heart. And the phrase there, take this to heart, in the Hebrew literally means put this in your heart. Stick it in your heart, this thought, this thought of death. And your heart wasn't just this emotional thing, you know, pumps blood, whatever you think of it. In their mindset, the heart was the idea of the core of your being where you make your decisions. It's like the control center for your body where you determine what you're going to do. He goes, stick this knowledge of your death being your destiny and stick that in the place where you make your decisions. So every time you make a decision, you run it through the grid of death. And you think to yourself, well, I'm going to die, so what? When I die, which decision will I care about more? He says, that should be in your heart. When you make decisions, you make them in light of death. And saying, when I die, will I care about this? What decision will, will be more important when I die? Because death's my destiny. See, and he reminds us of this. And, and we're not, we don't like to talk about this stuff. This is uncomfortable for us. How many people just, you know, that you pass by and during the day want to talk about death? It's something we gloss over, something we just want to move on. You know, let's talk about the birth. Let's talk about a baby being born. Let's talk about how awesome it was and this and that. No, no, no. Solomon says, if you were wise, you would spend time thinking about death. Because that's your destiny. And honestly, there's not a whole lot of people that will remind you of that. But you are going to die. 
and you need to start making decisions based upon the fact that you're going to die any day, any second. He says, sorrow is better than laughter. Has anyone ever heard that from anyone else? Sol Solomon, other than Solomon, sorrow is better than laughter. You see, we, we don't believe this. I'm, I'm at the funeral, right, on, on uh, Friday, this Friday, and, and my aunt's bawling her eyes out, and one of my relatives comes up, hugs her, and I just hear her whispering to my aunt, oh, don't cry. Everything's fine. Oh, yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, don't cry. We, we immediately feel like we've got to fix it if someone's crying. Like something's wrong if you're sad. You know, here's some, here's some medication. Maybe you need to go on medication because you're sad. And, and sadness isn't right. And so let me, let me dampen your emotions a little bit, put you in a fog so you won't hurt so much. And then other people take it to the extreme of, oh, you're sad? Well, then there must not be a God. I'm sad. How can there be a God, right? Look at all these sad people. How could there be a God? Well, according to that God, he says sorrow is actually better than laughter. It's better for you. While it may not be more fun, there's a good that it does in you. James explains how those trials and those difficult times actually give you the character and the perseverance in life. It's actually a good thing. And he says a good, he says a, a sad face is good for the heart. And, and you guys, sometimes we just, we have all this pressure, like we've got to be, you know, these smiley people all the time. And absolutely, there's a time to rejoice, seriously. And I think the general flow of our lives is one where we're filled with absolute joy and peace. And not saying that I don't have that. I'm just saying that there are times when you, you're still sad. And, and, uh, and, and to fake it, that's what's wrong. That's deception. And, and that you, you shouldn't feel like you need to come to church and, and put on a face, you know, and, and pretend you're happy if your life's falling apart. And a lot of people, when, when life's difficult, they go, I don't want to go to church. I, I don't want to go to church and then just put on a fake smile. I didn't say go to church and put on a fake smile. I just said go to church. But they don't want to come because they feel like they have to fake it. And honestly, that's why I left. It's like, I just got to go around and fake it. It's like, no, no, it, there's nothing wrong with being sad over the things we ought to be sad over. This is wrong to be sad over stupid things. But, but Jesus, it says when he saw the multitudes and how they were like a sheep without a shepherd, it says he felt compassion. And the word compassion is really a horrible translation in my mind because the, the Greek word is, is, is the word bowels. It's, it's, it's not like he looked at the people. When you think compassion, you think you go... Oh, a little girl tripped. Oh, you know, right? That's compassion. But the word that's used there is, is, is a gut wrenching. It's like someone just got hit by a train. You don't go, oh, your, your stomach turns. You just get sick to your stomach. And that's the emotion that Jesus felt when he saw these people wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. It killed him. It was gut wrenching. It was like, oh, this is awful. This is, this, is, uh, this is awful. And, and, and that's the idea, you know, a sad face is, is good for the heart. And then he says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. That, that the fool is the person that always wants to keep laughing and joking about everything and not deal with the issues. Because that's the fool, but the heart of the wise, so the wise person actually will spend time mourning. The wise person will actually grieve over the things that he ought to be grievous over. To actually dwell over death and think about, gosh, that is an awful thing for some people and it's a wonderful thing for some people. But to take it to heart and to think about it and think about death, that's what the wise person does. And, and he says this in verse 5, he says, it's better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. Because it's so much better to, to heed, you know, when a wise man speaks. That's Solomon here, okay? He's wiser than you are. I'm not saying I am. I'm saying Solomon is. He's wiser than you are, and so it would be good for you 
if you'd listen to him. Listen to what he says and maybe avoid some of the things that he's done rather than going down the, the same dead end roads. It's wise. It's not more fun. I mean, who wants to go from here and dwell on death and think, wow, that'd be fun. You know, Friday night, what do you want to do? Let's get a bunch of people together and talk about death. Oh, yeah. Let's put out flyers. You know? It's just, it's just dumb. You know, but he says it's better for you than to, to do that than to listen to the, 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 the song of fools. And he says, and that's like, like the crackling of thorns under the pot. And he says, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. And, and you guys, I struggle with this because... Uh, because if I'm honest with myself, I have to say, I like stupid. Is that good grammar? I like, I, I like the songs of fools. I do. I like to just laugh. I like, I like finding the stupidest movie at the video store, like just the one that you know has no plot, you know, you know, the comedy that, you know, just makes no sense. And I just like to just turn it on and then just laugh. Like, oh, man, you know, it's go, oh, what a great night. You know, just, uh, it, just so, uh, that's fun to me. I love getting together with a bunch of guys that just know how to talk about stupid things. You know, while the other girls are in the room sharing their feelings, we just talk about stupid, you know, and, and just, you know, what, what can we talk about? Uh, that's, I like that because it's this, this escape from reality is what we enjoy. Let's, just, let's not deal with the real Let's not talk about the fact we're going to die. Let's just go laugh. I mean, this, this whole thing, the songs of fools, the song of fools we love. Every generation has loved the song of fools. For those who are back with the Beatles, you remember, you remember the song Imagine? What a great song, huh? What does it say? Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for the day. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And I hope someday you'll join us and the world can be as one. Wouldn't that be beautiful? If we just pretended there was no heaven, just do it. Pretend there's no heaven. There's no hell, and it's just all about today, and we just all have a good time, and everyone joins in this whole make-believe dream. Think about how fun it could be. Imagine. That's the message. That's the song of fools, and we love it, and we'll sing it. It'll be one of our favorite songs. And it doesn't change throughout time, you know? More modern, it's, it's just, okay, now all I want to do is have some fun. I got the feeling I'm not the only one. <laughs> See? <laughs> and, and it's like, wow, you know, I, I like that. You know, it's fun. And I, I just start thinking about, you know, my childhood and all the songs I grew up with. And I loved, I loved all different types of music. And, and it was like the dumber the song, the more I liked it. The, 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 the name, the more meaningless the name, Oingo Boingo. Yeah! No, Chamba Wamba. Yeah, that's an even better name. Let's just come up with names. That just, let's just try to come up with a, you know, these, these songs. Oh, good, I can dance if I want to. I can leave my friends behind. Because my friends don't dance, and if they don't dance, they're no friends of mine. And it's like, oh, yeah, what a great song. So you're going to let us just whip it. Whip it good in the shade, you know? Shape it up, get straight, go for it, move ahead, try to detect it. It's not too late, you know. It's like, yeah, you know, that's a great song, you know. And we sing it, yeah, na, 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 you know, and, and we're just like, wow, this is the best. You know, and even now, it's like, don't you want to just sing some of those songs together? Come on, shout, shout, let her, you know. And it's like, oh, let's just do that, you know, because those were, those were the best. Those were so fun. And we just love, we love singing them. We love to stay in this mode right now where we could just sit. It wouldn't be fun to just sit right now for like half an hour and just think about the old songs and just start singing them together, right? That's fun. Or let's run Happy Gilmore next Sunday, you know? <laughs> let's, uh, let's, just, let's just do that. Let's just get our mind in this total fog and this make-believe, you know, and just, just to find the stupidest things. Let's get together, you know, and the following week will be three amigos and we'll just, let's just, let's just laugh. You know, that's fun. 
And, and I, I, I look at this passage and I go, man, that's so me. I so love to just escape reality. We love to be plastic. We love to be in a fog. And it's like you never see this more clearly until you go to another country and people actually talk about death. And they actually weep and wail and, and there are no answers for some of them. You know, then you realize, wow, we are so fake over there. We're in such a fog. And we talk about the stupidest things on earth. And, and we like it, we love it, and we surround ourselves with it. And then you read these words and you go, oh, man, it's the fool. It's the fool that keeps his heart in the house of pleasure. And yeah, there's a time to laugh. He, he says it in the same book. There's a time to laugh, there's a time to cry. But it's like we don't want that other side. We want to stay in this house of pleasure. And he says, you know what, you're a fool. I mean, when you read this book, isn't it true that God's biggest problem, not saying that God has problems, okay, don't get, you know what I mean. When you read this book, isn't it true that God's biggest problem is keeping his covenant people focused? It's not the world. The world's been wicked from the start. The biggest problem is keeping his covenant people focused. Every time he gets them at one point, they just run off and do their thing again. And so what makes, it, what makes us think that it's different now? I mean, if, if, if they wrote about the church here in Simi Valley and everything else, what would they say in this book? It'd be like, oh yeah, there's this group that just so sought after comfort, pleasure, and everything else, and they forgot all about the fact that people die and spend eternity apart from him. And they lost their vision, they lost their focus, just like everyone else did in history. But every once in a while, every once in a while, there's a person that stands out in Scripture that stays focused all the way through. You know? And it's rare. It's so rare. You can't expect to have everyone there. You know, one of those guys is, a, is, a, is a, what's it? Caleb. I love the story of Caleb. Caleb. Caleb and Joshua, you remember they're the two good spies? You remember when they sent the 12 spies over, you know, hey, check out this area, see if we can win. And they all go, oh no, it's too hard, it's too hard. But Caleb and Joshua go, no, 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 we can do it. And, but everyone else was against them, and so God makes them wander around in the desert for 40 years. And then I, I love what Caleb says at the end of his life, after that whole wandering, because God keeps him alive, because he was faithful. And listen to these words in Joshua 14, verse 10. He says, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved, moved about in the desert, so here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. I just love that. This guy goes, don't you remember 45 years ago? What did I say? I said, we could take it. He goes, I'm 85 years old now. And that hill country belongs to me. And I can fight like I fought 45 years ago. So let's go and let's take it. You think, yeah. I, I just love that passage. This guy that just says, you know what? I can do it. I'm still focused. I still know what I'm on this earth to do. I'm still here to fight for the Lord. I've been waiting 45 years for a whole new generation to die, pass away, so another one would come, but I kept my focus the whole time. You go, man, he's still fired up. You know, one of the cool things about this last trip, this last weekend, was I, I got to go and see uh, my wife's grandma, Grandma Clara. And so a lot of you guys know her that, that were here when the church was, was er, you know, early on. She uh, just the sweetest lady who just loves the Lord and just has such a unique relationship with Him. She's been through everything in life, gone through so much in, in life. And, and we, we take her out to dinner, and I'm sitting across from this 92-year-old lady, just sharp as a tack, still just, just, just an awesome, awesome woman. And she looks at me and she goes, Honey, I need some advice from you. That, that's just a humbling statement. 